sorry about that. If you like to watch the recordings, um, you're going to, unfortunately, I didn't record the first 20 minutes of this lecture. Let's continue. Okay, uh, so let's talk about some of the things. So again, getting back to protein purification, uh, again, this is a, a very long drawn out process. It can be very uh, frustrating. And at the end, when you get pure protein, it's only a small fraction of what you started with. Uh, when we do a quantitative analysis of protein purification, uh, there's a couple things we wanna look for. Uh, first is total protein. Um, total protein is all of the proteins. So that's your protein of interest plus all of the other proteins from your protein sample. So once we bust the cells open, all of the proteins contained in those cells count towards total protein. And again, we would use a technique like a Bradford assay or a Bayerette assay, which simply looks for, you know, detects protein and can quantify protein um, in order to get that number. Okay, so we have total protein. And again, we would use a, a Bradford or a, a Bayerette assay to get this number. Oops. Okay, that's supposed to say Bradford. I do have a mouse pen, but it doesn't help very much. It's just hard to write. Um, next, we want to look at total activity. Uh, so total activity, uh, we're going to express this as a ratio of activity to volume. Um, for total activity, uh, again, we need a special assay that we can use that detects the activity of our protein of interest. Um, so for example, I gave you the example of um, reduction of NAD. So if our, if our protein, uh, once we set up the reactions for our protein, if our protein reduces uh, NAD to NADH, uh, we can see the difference in the quantity of, of uh, oxidized NAD and reduced NAD by doing uh, spectrophotometry, by, by looking at, at, at a, uh, sorry, yeah, by, by looking at a, at a, a, on a, on a mass, not a mass spec, but on a, uh, a spectrophotometer, okay, just by looking at, at the way they absorb light. Um, next, we want to look for yield. Uh, yield is percent of activity retained from the homogenate. So as I said before, once we get our purified protein sample, it's only going to be about 1% of the total Pro, of the, the total protein of interest that you started with, if you're lucky, right? So yield means percentage of activity retained from the homogenate. So the homogenate is referring to the, the, the crude homogenate. So that's the stuff you get right after you break the cells open. It's the homogenate. So you want to assay that for your protein of interest and then assay your final purified protein with the same assay. So, uh, so th this way we're looking at the, the activity per unit volume in the crude lysate versus the activity per unit volume in the purified protein. And of course, it's probably, unless you concentrated your purified protein down a lot, it's going to be a lot less in your purified protein just because we're, we're going to lose protein at every step. That's just the, the nature of the beast, right? Um, we're gonna lose protein at every step and we're gonna end up with only a small percentage of pure protein relative to the amount of protein that we started with. Okay, so that's yield. We're looking at the enzymatic activity in the homogenate versus the enzymatic, enzymatic activity in the purified protein. Um, finally, we wanna look at purification level. Uh, this is the specific activity um, Okay, so this is, a, this is a, rather than a percentage, this is a ratio of the specific activity in the purified protein over the specific activity of the homogenate. So um, this is a measure of just how pure 
your protein sample is by looking at, at, at the fractional activity of the, uh, you know, what's in the, the homogenate versus what is in your pure protein sample. And let's take a look, before I continue, let's take a look at this um, figure. So what we're looking at here, uh, this is a mock-up of an SDS page gel. Whenever you do a protein purification, it's important to take samples every step of the way. Okay, so you take samples of your, of your crude lysate, you take uh, samples of the supernatant and the pellet from each of your centrifugations. Uh, if you do ion exchange chromatography, you, you, take you take samples every step along the way. So let's look at, so, and remember, each protein purification is going to be different uh, based on the properties of your protein. So this isn't set in stone, okay? This, this isn't that the way you, you do protein purification, it's going to change. So for this particular purification, uh, we have the homogenate, so we're going to have that in, in pretty much every uh, type of protein purification you do. Uh, salt fractionization. So here, rather than centrifuging, their first step was to salt out the protein uh, based on solubility. So we have salt fractionization. So this is uh, salting out. Um, and you can see when they salted out the proteins, they... Um, well, there's not a huge difference. You can see some proteins. There's a band uh, band here they got rid of, band here they got rid of. So we're, we're getting rid of some of the protein, some of the contaminating proteins that we don't want. Uh, next, ion exchange chromatography. And you can see that we got rid of a, a couple more bands that we really don't need. Uh, next step, um, gel filtration chromatography. So this in this example, we're... Um, sorting out the proteins by size. You can see there's a whole lot more proteins we got rid of. Uh, finally, the last step, step affinity chromatography, and we get one single band of protein that represents our protein of interest. Okay, another way that we can purify proteins uh, is based on uh, ultracentrifugation. Okay, ultracentrifugation, this is, um, these are, this is done by centrifuges that spin incredibly, incredibly fast. Uh, we don't have an ultracentrifuge here at Tech. Um, these things spin like extremely, extremely, extremely fast. So I don't know if you guys have ever used the, the centrifuge. I don't think anybody, no, I don't think I've used the centrifuge with a class since last year. Um, we have a centrifuge upstairs that, uh, that we might use this semester. Um, it's important to balance it. So you'll notice that when I balance the centrifuge upstairs, um, I have one of these, these uh, old fashioned balances that kind of go like this. Um, and what I do for, for each pair of tubes, I'll put them each on, on one of those stands and, and make sure that they're the same before I put them in the centrifuge. So the centrifuge doesn't get unbalanced. If it gets unbalanced, that can do a lot of damage to the machine. Um, centrifuges today are pretty safe. Uh, however, in the old days, if a centrifuge was unbalanced, it wasn't unusual for the centrifuge rotor to fly out from the centrifuge and maybe fly through a wall because um, th these things do spin fast. Okay. Now the centrifuge we have upstairs, that is nothing compared to an ultra centrifuge. So um, when I was doing my postdoc, uh, we had an ultra centrifuge in that lab and you have to balance these things down to the microgram. Okay, the, the, the samples have to be down to the microgram, almost the, the same weight. These things spin extremely, extremely fast, like, like 200,000 RPM, really, really fast. Um, and as a matter of fact, they spin so fast. Have you, have you guys ever seen uh, centrifuge rotors? Well, I'll, I'll, 
later on this semester when we uh, when we're working in the lab, I'll, I'll show you our centrifuge. Um, the centrifuge rotors that look similar in an ultra centrifuge, but you have to log the time. I mean, these are made out of uh, like aircraft aluminum. In an ultra centrifuge, you have to keep a log of the time that you've run that rotor, because even though it's made of high grade, uh, you know, aircraft grade aluminum, over time it, it will the, the stresses involved in ultra centrifugation are, are just going to wear the thing out. So it's ultra centrifugation is really crazy high centrifugation. It's, it's it's insane. Okay, getting back to purifying proteins by ultra centrifugation. Um, Sedimentation velocity depends on a couple things like mass, shape, and density of the solution. So, Svedberg units uh, or, or sent, uh, sedimentation units um, are determined by these factors. By, so, by mass, by shape, by density of the solution. So, different things are going to set, sediment at different rates. Uh, based on their mass, their shape, their density of the solution, that um, that determines their Svedberg units and exactly where they will uh, sediment. So we can separate out different things like like uh, RNA. I'm sorry, press the wrong button. There we go. So we can separate out different things like uh, like RNA, DNA, uh, glycogen, uh, ribosomes, and polysomes nuclei okay. and this is all based on uh, mass shape and size of the of the uh, solution okay so just a, another way that we can uh, purify proteins based on their um, properties Okay, so let's talk about uh, recombinant DNA technology and fusion tags. Um, a couple slides ago, I already touched on this when we talked about uh, maltose binding protein here. Okay, so one way that we can express proteins in large amounts for, for purification is by making recombinant proteins and expressing them in bacteria or yeast. So you can see here, if we can take our target gene that encodes our gene of interest and clone that into uh, a special type of DNA called an expression vector. Uh, so expression vectors, um, they do two things. So we, we, we can put our, our gene of interest into them and store our gene of interest in the expression vector. Then we can put the expression vector into bacteria and under certain conditions, we can have the bacteria make a lot more of that protein. Okay. Sometimes this is done in yeast too. Sometimes we can put uh, an expression vector in yeast and have that express a lot more of our protein. Okay. One thing that we can do when we clone into the expression vector, we can clone it into an expression vector that has a fusion tag. Okay. One example of a fusion tag is maltose binding protein. So we already went through this example. So maltose binding protein binds to amylose with very high affinity. So we can do affinity chromatography in order to, to purify our fusion protein. And affinity chromatography, like, like we talked about before, when we talked about affinity chromatography, this is a very powerful technique. Um, Oftentimes we can just one single step with affinity chromatography purify our protein. Okay, and, and you saw with that SDS page gel we looked at before, there was all those different steps. There was salting out, there was ion exchange chromatography, there was gel exclusion chromatography before finally affinity chromatography. Okay, in some cases with fusion proteins, we can skip all those other steps, go straight to affinity chromatography and get pure protein in one step, which makes it a really powerful technique. Okay, so let's go back to the, that other slide. Okay, so recombinant DNA technology can add a fusion tag to a protein 
to make one step purification by affinity chromatography possible. Um, examples of this, uh, maltose binding protein, that was the, the figure we just looked at. Uh, GST or glutathol, glu, pardon me, glutathione S transferase. Uh, this also makes a good fusion tag that we can use to purify the protein. By and large, the one that's used most nowadays is called a HIS tag. HIS tags are popular because they're very small. Okay, all a HIS tag is, it's six histidine res residues in a row. Okay, so it's just H, 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 H. Okay, so all we're adding are, well, well the fusion tag is just six amino acids. Okay, then of course, uh, we, we're, we're going to add a little bit of linker DNA, and in that linker DNA, we're going to put uh, a site that we can use uh, to proteolytically cleave the fusion tag away from the protein. However, you know, this, this, uh, the HIST tag is so small that um, it, it seldom interferes with the activity of your protein, so that's really not very much of a problem. Okay. So, uh, his tags bind with very high affinity to uh, divalent cations like like copper or nickel. Okay, so here's uh, nickel superflow uh, resin. Um, you can also use copper resin as well. Okay, so let's look at the steps involved in uh, expressing a protein with a his tag. So the first step, of course, is to clone it into the expression vector. Um, the expression vector has a multiple cloning site, and uh, the multiple cloning site just makes it easier to take your protein of interest and put it in the right spot, though, so that it can express the fusion tag. Now, let's get, I'm not going to get into the weeds talking about how to clone. This is a little trickier than I'm explaining. Um, you do have to make sure that your, uh, your protein of interest is in frame with the fusion tag. Um, how many of you have had genetics already? So most of, so you know that there's, there's three reading frames when, when we're looking at the, uh, the ORF of a protein or the open reading frame of a protein. So there's three, re three reading frames, three different ways that the codons can be read to, to make, uh, to code for amino acids and to make a protein, right? So if you're, trying to, uh, to create a fusion protein, you have to make sure that you clone your protein of interest in frame with the fusion tag so that it's expressed properly. If your protein of interest is out of frame or it's in a different reading frame than your fusion tag, it's not gonna express properly and you're gonna have a mess. You're probably gonna have to do the whole project over again. Okay, so anyway, that, that's farther into it than I planned on going, but um, so you, you clone your protein of interest into your expression vector. Um, then you want to take your expression vector, and this needs to go into um, an expression host, which is uh, a type of bacteria uh, capable of expressing your protein. Um, after you put it in your expression host, you, um, you need to induce the host I'm getting farther into the weeds than I wanted to on this. <laughs> um, let me skip over that part. So, so, so there's something. That, there's certain things you have to do to make the pro, the, the bacteria start expressing your uh, protein at high levels. After it express your pro, expresses your protein at high levels, you uh, you can then just take the bacteria, make a crude lysate, and that crude lysate can more or less go directly over your uh, affinity column. Okay, of course, you're going you're gonna to spin down all of the debris. After that spin, you just take the, the supernatant from that crude lysate. That can go right over the column. Okay, the, the His tag is going to bind with high affinity to the divalent cations on the resin. And then your next step, so you're, you're going to want to do a couple washes to, to wash away the impurities. And 
uh, then there's a couple ways you can loot off the, uh, uh, let me think, uh, usually uh, increasing concentrations of imidazole is going to interrupt that interaction between the his tag and the column, and then you'll get very pure protein in pretty much one step. Okay, and here I kind of skipped over. Here they're showing a, a native purification uh, versus a denaturing purification. Um, that's another nice thing about a his tag is that you can denature the proteins and the his tag will still stick to the, the column. Okay, maltose binding protein, that won't work. Um, the difference here, if your protein of interest is soluble, you can do a native purification. If your uh, protein of interest is insoluble. In other words, if it's um, if it's going, if it's isolating to the um, the pellet fraction, then you're going to have to denature it. Again, you're going to have to use a denaturing solution like urea or guanidinium. Uh, this gets a little bit messier, but again, um, it's not going to interrupt the. Uh, it's not going to interfere with the his tags interaction with the uh, with the column. All right, so take home message here. When we're purifying uh, recombinant proteins with a fusion tag, putting a fusion tag on a protein is kind of put like putting a handle on it so that we can reach in, grab it by the handle and pull it out, okay? I know I kind of got, uh, I know this isn't a genetics class and I, uh, I kind of got deep in the weeds on explaining exactly how the cloning works, but don't worry about that too much. All right, that takes us to the end of this PowerPoint. Anybody have any questions on this? Anything we covered today before we continue? All right, let me look at, so I don't see anything from Zoom either. So let's continue with the next PowerPoint. Okay, using immunology to investigate proteins. This is really interesting. I, I actually did a lot of this in grad school. Um, it's, these are, there's some pretty uh, neat immunodetection techniques. Um, so it's possible to generate antibodies that are specific to a particular protein. All right. Um, so let's talk about antibodies a little bit before we get into this. So. This is something you guys might be a little more familiar with since we're in the, in the middle of a pandemic. Um, does everybody familiar with exactly what antibodies are? Okay, we'll talk about it a little bit. So antibodies are specifically sticky proteins of the immune system. So what do I mean by specifically sticky? Um, specifically sticky is they, they stick to some things, but not others. Okay, so and the things that they're specifically sticky for um, when they're generated by our immune system are what are called antigens. So antigens are uh, molecular determinants on the surface of pathogens. So what are pathogens? So a, a pathogen is basically a foreign invader. So a pathogen can be a bacterium. Of course, we're in the middle of a pandemic. We know a pathogen can be a virus like, like uh, the uh, coronavirus that causes COVID-19. Um, pathogens can be parasites. Um, pathogens can even be prions or, or proteins, okay? So down below in this figure, uh, we're looking at uh, a very simple diagram of a antibody, okay? And again, these are proteins that are uh, made by cells of your immune system. Uh, specifically a type of cell called uh, a B cell, which uh, differentiates into something called a plasma cell when it's making a lot of these antibodies. Um, let's look at the different parts of an antibody. So an antibody is made from four polypeptide chains, two heavy chains and two light chains. Okay, so here 
is a heavy chain. Here's another heavy chain. And here are the two light chains here and here. Okay. Um, you can see an antibody looks pretty much like the letter Y. Um, we can separate an antibody into two parts. Um, so this one part here, it's what's called the FC fragment, which stands for the crystallizable fragments. And these two arms are the arms of the Y. So kind of like if you're doing the YMCA dance, the things that are, are sticking out like your arms, um, these are called the FAB fragments. Okay, and the AB stands for antigen binding. So that's F subscript AB. Okay, so the FAB fragments, this is where the interesting stuff is going on. As, as far as immunodetection goes, this is where the really interesting stuff is going on. So the sticky bits or, or the parts that actually recognize foreign antigen are like kind of, again, if you do on the YMCA dance, it's, it's where your hands are, which, which is convenient because the sticky bits are kind of the grabby bits, right? So right where your hands are, these are the parts that are gonna bind to antigen here and here where it says antigen binding sites, okay? So just as enzymes are very specific for substrates, antibodies are very specific for antigen. Um, and again, antigens are these um, determinants on the surface of pathogens, um, a foreign substance that elic elicits an immune response. So in order for antibodies to be generated, your body has to recognize something as foreign, uh, and then it will generate antibodies against that foreign substance. Okay, so again, looking at parts of the antibody. So the, each antibody has two antigen binding sites or paratopes. So again, what I indicated with my hands here, these are the paratopes or the sticky bits that recognize the antigen. Um, antigen binding sites bind specific regions of the antigen called antigenic determinants or epitopes. Okay, so the part of the foreign molecule that is bound to by the antigen, by the antibody uh, is called an epitope. Okay, so looking here, obviously we're looking at the ribbon diagram of a protein. Uh, this is actually the ribbon diagram of an antibody. So this is what an antibody looks like in a ribbon diagram. So again, we can see uh, one heavy chain in blue. The other heavy chain is in red. And then we have the two light chains in green and yellow. Okay. Also notice we haven't talked about disulfide bonds yet, but um, disulfide bonds hold together the heavy chains and they hold the, the heavy chains to the light chains as well. All right, so this is all great. You know, we, our, our bodies make these sticky proteins that help us get rid of foreign invaders in our bodies, but how can we use this in the laboratory? Okay, how can we use this in the laboratory to detect proteins? Well, if we purify a protein, just like we talked about in that last PowerPoint, and then inject that protein into a lab animal like a rabbit, the, rabbit, the rabbit's immune system is gonna recognize that protein as foreign. Recognizing that protein as foreign, it's going to produce antibodies against that particular protein. So um, now we're gonna have rabbit antibodies that are specifically sticky for our purified protein. And of course, these antibodies will be very useful in experiments then. 
So just as enzymes are very specific for a substrate, antibodies are specific for an antigen. Um, when, we carry, when we use a purified protein and trick a rabbit's immune system into thinking that's an antigen, then the antibodies produced by that rabbit are going to recognize epitopes contained on our protein of interest. Okay, hopefully that all makes sense. Oh, I see people fidgeting. Are we out of time? Yes, we are. Okay. All right. We'll continue with this on Wednesday. Um, so everybody, I haven't checked the homework module yet, but uh, don't forget that the deadline is coming up in, I think, two weeks for ho homework module one. So make sure you complete that before the deadline. Um, other than that, be careful. I know the roads are slick. I will see you later. Okay, if there's no questions from Zoom, I'm going to stop the, uh, the meeting here and I'll see you guys on Wednesday.